Praise the Lord, saints. This is Mina Lee coming to you again at Faithful Walk Healing Ministries. Happy New Year to you all. Um, it's January of 2014. We've made it to another year. This is going to be an extremely significant year as far as the Word of God and prophecy and current events are concerned. We're falling into the the tetrad of the blood moons that are to take place in 2014 and 2015 in the months of April and October. Um, we also have a total solar eclipse coming up. I believe it's in March of 2015. So this is a very significant time in the body of Christ of knowing the season that we're in. Um, just real quick, I want to share with you all that I've gotten about a half a dozen confirmations from half a do about a half a dozen people around the globe that don't know each other that the Lord has given them that the final harvest or revival is upon us. Um, I've seen YouTube videos, I've gotten emails and phone calls and and even I myself, the Lord has spoken to me uh, several days ago in prayer. I was in prayer and the Lord spoke to me three times. He said, the revival is upon us. The revival is upon us. The revival has begun. Or excuse me, I said it's upon us, but he said the revival has begun. So this is the final harvest saints that many ministers have been talking about throughout the years that would happen right before the rapture of Jesus, the Jesus Christ rapturing the saints, uh, his bride. Um, it's here. This is what we're looking at right now. And um, I'm excited about the times that we're currently in. And I just pray that everyone is prepared. Um, this is definitely a season where the enemy is definitely on a rampage. I myself, saints, have been under attack. I pray that and ask that you will keep me in your prayers. Um, but it, know, it lets me know that I'm doing something right. I've had much sabotage and... Uh, even some slander go on um, recently, but I'm okay with that because um, Jesus said that they will hate you because they hated me first. Because And then at the same time, the Lord has opened up some very dynamic doors, phenomenal doors for the ministry for 2014. The Lord has allowed us to cross even more people in ministry. Um, we're about to have our Watchmen on the Wall meeting on January 24th, which is at this time of this taping of the video would be this Friday. We have guest speaker Waleed Shabbat on there. We have some upcoming potential speakers in the future. Author John Shorey also recently found out, um, or excuse me, uh, contacted or was contacted by, I keep saying this wrong, by a... Uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn, um, the author of The Harbinger, also the pastor of Beth Israel up in New Jersey, that um, sometime this year too, he will be one of our guest speakers on The Watchman on the Wall. So God's doing some dynamic things with the ministry. I'm very excited. Um, and with, of course, with growth and uh, maturity and purification comes much persecution. And I do understand that role as a minister and a prophetess. Um, that the devil will come after you. But this is a time, saints, of not allowing Satan to cause discord in between us. Um, we understand that there are definitely wolves in sheep's clothing out there. There's definitely lukewarm out there. There are people out there who are teaching false doctrines. There are false prophets. There are uh, people among us that um, are troubled. They're not who they seem. And that is definitely in the churches. They're in the pews. They're in the choir. They're in the pulpits, preaching they're on television, they're on radio. They're everywhere. But this is not for those who are, are wolves in sheep clothing. And I'm not addressing those who are playing with their salvation i'm talking about the true members of the body of christ the bride of jesus christ we are to make sure saints that we are operating in the holy spirit which is wisdom knowledge and understanding according to the scriptures that he will allow us to deal with people based off of the spirit that they're operating in and not based off of the man we need to make sure that we are testing the spirit with the spirit and not the man with the spirit because when we touch the when we excuse me, when we test the man we will find flaws. I just had a, a brother, a powerful prophet in the Lord reveal, you know, give this to me the other day. We were talking about some of the persecution that's going on in the in the body of Christ and he was saying, you know, he says the problem, sis, is that the people are testing the man instead of the spirit. And when you test the man, you're going to find flaws. 
We must understand, saints, that we all fall short of the glory of God, every single one of us. And we must also understand that the very method that we judge, we will also be judged. That's scripture. That's what Jesus himself stated. I'm not saying that we can't judge because actually the scripture says we can. In the church, we cannot judge the world because we're not of the world, but we are to judge the church. But you must understand we are not to be hypocrites. We need to make sure our logs are removed out of our own eyes so we can see the moat in our brethren we need to make sure saints that we're not following falling into slander and we're not speaking evil against our brethren we need to also make sure we're not gossiping because that is not of god if we see our brethren in error if we see them falling away by the stray or falling astray or by by the wayside saints we are to help them we are to even rebuke them and reprove them and we are to pray for them we are not to gossip about them we are not to slander them that is not of christ we don't see anywhere in the four gospels jesus slandering and gossiping about those who didn't believe in him he didn't even do it to the pharisees the pharisees who were full of sacrilegious spirits he told them to their face who they were he didn't talk about them behind their back. He didn't call nobody up on the phone. He didn't send telegrams. Jesus told them to their face who they were. And even still, he gave them the opportunity to come to the knowledge of the truth, to accept him for who he is. And so we too, as Christians, remember saints, the word Christian means Christ-like, meaning we're following in his footsteps. We are to follow in Jesus' footsteps. That is our duty. We must understand that he requires us to live holy. And holiness is not defined by your clothes, your makeup, your hair, your pants, your church, how popular you are, your television program, your radio program, your internet program, whatever the case may be. That is not defined as holiness. Holiness is circumcision of heart. It starts within you first. We are required to walk in love remember that all the gifts will pass away so let's not get caught up in prophecy and and tongues interpretation of tongues even though i'm a prophetess and the lord has given me the gift of knowledge and discernment and I, I have the anointing to teach i don't even get caught up in that because that does not define my salvation my personal walk with jesus christ is what defines my salvation and so we all must make sure that we are are operating in love because that's the foundation of who we are we are operating like christ because he told us to take up our cross and follow him meaning that we live like him we eat like him we drink like him and i say that more hypothetically than physically but more importantly we we drink with we excuse me not drink. we teach like him we forgive like he he forgave we we live like he lived saints period remember judas was right there in his face and he knew he was the devil. He knew that he was the son of perdition. He had been chosen from the beginning. But Jesus did not treat Judas any differently. Jesus did not spit in Judas' face. He didn't talk about him. He didn't gossip. He loved Judas. Even though he knew that that was going to be the very one that would betray him. And Judas ate and slept, slept and talked and hung out with Jesus and all the rest of the disciples. And Jesus did not treat him any differently than he treated John or Peter or anyone else for that matter. And so we must understand that, saints. We must not allow Satan to come in and sow seeds of discord. I see that happening so much. I want you to know that there's a time coming now, saints. I believe that shortly we're going to have to go underground. I mean, I'm watching the Christians getting persecuted in this country. It's already happening for our brothers and sisters overseas. Saints, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia and, and, and Iran, even in Israel and Egypt. We need to pray for our, our Christian brothers and sisters in China and in Russia where they're being persecuted, where it's hostile to believe upon Jesus, to have a Bible, to, to profet, profess your, your uh, confess and proclaim your faith. It is, you will get killed, you will get beaten, you will get thrown into prison, saints. And, but I'm seeing that time coming here. I don't know how bad it's going to get in this country. I don't. Um, maybe it won't get as bad as it is overseas. Maybe it will. I'm not sure, saints, but I will tell you this. The persecution of the Christians is here. 
I just in the past two weeks, I've heard multiple stories of people that I personally, and I do mean personally know people that are personally close to me, who are people that I love dearly, who are ministers and teachers and, and anointed men and women of God who are being kicked off of uh, social media and, and videos and emails are being hacked or people are sending them death threats because they're teaching the word of God, because they're teaching the whole truth without compromise without compromise we must stand we must not compromise the problem with a lot of these mega churches today saints is that they're compromisers they're, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing a lot of these churches where they're eating up their money and and they want to be bigger and bigger and bigger and they want to be more and more and more popular and more and more power but the power of god is not in them and the power of god is not in the midst of their congregation because the power that they're obtaining is the power of this world and that's the reason why many people are leaving the churches today Many people are leaving the churches because there's no intimacy, there's no deliverance, there's no healing, there's no change. And the people here are, are sitting in these churches and they have spiritual shackles and yokes upon them. And, and they're not getting delivered from these things. There's no change, there's no manifestation in the spirit. And so that's what's happening. Now, mind you, no church is perfect. So stop looking for the perfect church. But I want you to also understand. And there are also churches and teachers out there who are still out there, who are so popular, who are good men and women of God that are truly anointed. But it's far and few in between. The great turning away is upon us. Everybody has a different definition of what that meant. That's mentioned in Psychon Thessalonians. But I'm telling you. The time of the lukewarm, the church of Laodicea, we, we are here, saints. We are here. It's a time, again, I cannot reiterate more than enough that we are to have our lamps filled. We are to be the five wise virgin saints waiting for the bridegroom, prepared, ready for his return. His return is definitely upon us, saints. This is the time of the final harvest. We're about to see some major things unfold this year, saints. So things that may even shake some of us up. The Lord spoke to me and I, I didn't want to post this anywhere, but I'm going to share this with you here on the video. The Lord spoke to me about a month or so ago. And he let me know, maybe a little more than that. He let me know a lot of people are going to die. And when I say that, I mean death is coming to a lot of people. And um, he was even letting me know that uh, s several or many of his children are going to die. Um, he's going to allow them to die for reasons of them not having to go through what's coming upon the planet. And because they won't qualify for the rapture. Now, it may sound controversial, but I want you to go to understand that you have a better chance of, of passing away and and being lukewarm and being able to repent of your sins. I mean, God is gracious in this dispensation of grace. He takes death, death, salvation. You can never serve the Lord for 80 years. And on the last day of your life, you can bow your head sincerely and, and repent of your sins and ask Jesus to come into your heart and die in that moment. And Jesus will take you to heaven. Yes, that can happen if you have the opportunity to do so. But when that rapture takes place, saints, he is not coming for the lukewarm. He's only coming for those who are sold out to him. He's coming for a bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And so because of that, that is the reason why so many Christians are going to be left behind. And let me tell you, it grieves him. It grieves him, saints, because so many of these people sitting in these churches, they are not prepared for the coming of the Lord. They have built their treasures on this planet they have not built their treasures in heaven. Their robes, their garments are not white. They're stained, they're wrinkled, they're blemished. Their oil lamps are not filled, they're empty. And they have, they have followed the traditions of religious, religious doctrine. They have followed their pastors. They have turned their church buildings into idols, into places of, of, of pagan worship instead of God worship. And God is not in his spirit is not dwelling amongst a lot of these places, saints. And many, many saints are going to be left behind. So we must make sure that we're living holy. God requires us 
to live holy saints. Please, please know that. Please remember that. Please understand the urgent, the urgent hour that we're in. We're in a, a moment, a season of urgency. Jesus is about to return and he requires us to live holy. I want to share with you all some things that the Lord has given me. Um, I was invited to or invited on a radio show on Blog Talk Radio, Prophecy of the End Times, that's hosted by uh, evangelist Michael Parker. And on January 1st, I went on and I did a show with him and I talked about the things that the Lord had given me for 2014. And so I want to share that with you all today. I'm going to go over and um, I was trying to set up my video where to see or to see if I had the proper equipment where I can show you all what some things of what I'm talking about. Because we're going to talk a little bit about the Hebrew language. But my equipment is not set up where I can do that. So because of that, I will talk about what the Lord has given me. And then at the end of the video... I will um, show you all pictures or uh, images of what I was talking about just because I, I believe that you should not only hear it, you should be able to see it because it just kind of works together better in our minds as far as retaining information is concerned. So I'm going to show, I'm going to share with you all some things that the Lord has given me. Um, I do have some small notes written down. So if you see me look into my left, which would probably be your right, just know it's because I'm referring back to the notes that, um, I have written down in regards to what God has given me. So, um, I just pray that this blesses your soul in Jesus name. And I pray that your eyes are, uh, your spiritual eyes are open, your hearts are open to receive what God has given me, and that what is given is not returned void, it is not written, in, that is not done in vain, um, but that it will, everything that is said will be planted on the hearts of of the men and women watching this this video today, and that it will take root, that it will not be sifted or devoured by the enemy in Jesus' name. So. 14 days saints before the new year of the Gregorian calendar, January 1st, the Lord came to me in the, middle, in the middle of the night and he began to talk to me in three parts. And in the first part, I saw a vi I had a vision where I saw a spirit, a beast, and this beast was walking up on the earth and he was huge. He was massive. And, and he had to be at least 100 feet tall, maybe, maybe bigger, maybe 200 feet tall. We're talking stories now. Stories meaning floors of a building. And he was massive. And when he walked, I mean, he was like, boom, 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 with each step he took. And wherever he stepped, he left a trail of destruction behind. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, the ancient spirit. And I was like, the ancient spirit. And... I'm continuing to watch this thing walk across the planet. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, in 14 days, this ancient spirit that has been bound for a thousand years will be released upon the earth. And I, I was like, what? You know, I, I didn't really, I, I couldn't comprehend what was being said. I heard it, but it was like a ancient spirit for a thousand years. I was kind of repeating it back like, okay. And so then that part ended and then the second part came and I was sitting up in my bed. So I don't know if I was dreaming or if I was a vision, I, I'm not really sure. But I saw these gold letters coming forth in front of me. They were shining, they were glowing. And as they came closer and closer and closer, I recognized what they were. They were the letters in Hebrew of the name of God, which is yud Hey vav Hey. And I recognized it immediately because several years ago, I began studying the Hebrew alphabet, alphabet and I recognized all 22 letters of the alphabet. Um, I began studying it because I learned that Hebrew, which is such a beautiful and pure language, um, has not only a meaning behind each letter, but also a numerical value. And it's all significant in when you find in the, uh, the, the Torah and uh, the uh, Talmud, the Tanakh, all of these different things, because Hebrew is such a 
powerful language. I said, I would tell people, you know, if you have spare time, you know, look into it. It's a very powerful language. It's a language that I actually believe is the original language that God spoke during um, creation because it has such an interactive meaning to it and, and value to each letter. So anyhow, I recognize yud heh being the unpronounceable name of God as the, the Jewish people um, say it is, you know, or what have you. I know a lot of people um, in the Christianity um, try to pronounce it. They've thrown vowels into it. I know the most common one is Yahweh, which I really don't agree with that. I mean, that's just my opinion, though. I don't necessarily agree with that name. Um, other people have, and the Messianic Jews I've learned that have tried to pronounce it, have used words like Yehovah and Yahuwah. And um, I agree with that a little bit more um, as far as the pronunciation, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that the unpronounceable name of God is spelled yud he vah -He, or Y-H-V-H. Um, v as in Victor. So that's what I saw coming in front of me. And I was like, okay, Lord, I recognize that. And the Lord began to speak to me. And this was the third part that he gave to me. And he said that in 2014, much cataclysms and pestilence was coming upon the land. And that the people, his children, would need to depend on him according to to, to Psalm 23 with emphasis on verse one. And so I thought to myself, I was like, Psalm 23, okay. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, even the heathen knows that one. And when I said that, the Lord spoke to me and he said, okay, but there's two meanings behind that there's a deeper meaning than just the lord is my shepherd i shall know one he began to speak to me and said that the people must not only depend on him his children again this is talking about the body of christ not the world not only have to depend on him as the physical aspects but the spiritual he was saying and he he began to he was speaking to me uh spirit to spirit he was pouring all this information into me and and i saw things like an image wise it was like an extraction of filth or 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 slime or brown stuff residue dredge even in, in some cases and i was like lord what am i seeing and he was saying that the backside too was that we needed to trust him not only to supply our physical needs but even in purifying us not only just purifying our spirits but keeping us pure because he's coming and the Lord gave that to me. Now, even after that, saints, he wasn't done with me. He had poured so much of this into my spirit that I couldn't even process it in my physical mind. It took me a while to even days even to process all that he had given me. And I couldn't even really speak on it. But for six additional days after that first night with a total of seven days, but for six additional days after that, in the middle of the night at some point, and I can't tell you what times they were, he would come to me and I, I would see in, in letters written, I am coming. I am coming. The first night or the second night. It was written in gold and then the third it was written in blue and the fourth it was written in gold and the fifth it was written in blue so it was blue and blue and gold blue and gold blue and gold blue and gold for six additional nights now blue represents um royalty it also well purple does too but blue represents the type of royalty um it also represents peace and gold represents the anointing and for six additional nights i saw this and I am was capitalized. So after seven days, the Lord really released me to begin to do some research on what he had given me. I wanted to look into it. And I began to really understand everything that the Lord was showing me. So first, I wanted to start with Psalm 23. And I wanted to do some research on it. And so I have a brother in Christ um, that um, I love very dearly, um, Rabbi Steve, Stephen ben Danoon. And um, I called him up on the phone and he was out and about. And I says, I just need you to do a favor for me. And he said, yes, what's that, sis? I says, I need you to read Psalm 23 for me in Hebrew because he's, he's Jewish. And he said, oh, yeah, I can do that. I have my, my Bible right here in, um, in my glove compartment. And so let me pull over and read it to you. So he pulls over and he opens it up and he begins to read it to me in Hebrew. 
and he he gets just the first verse you know and so when he finishes reading the first verse i said to him i said well in the english translation it's the lord is my shepherd i shall not want and he says to me he says yes yeah, he says but you know that last word that you're talking about that's translated as one he's like yeah there's actually more meaning to that there's actually like uh, uh two meanings behind that so i was excited because you know that was my first confirmation of what the lord had told me so he began to explain to me what the word really the true rooted word meant and it was like um i shall not lack anything and it was both the physical and the spiritual and so there I had my first confirmation, which was very powerful. The second thing after that was um, I wanted to see it written in Hebrew for myself. So I decided to go on the internet and look up Psalm 23 written in the actual Hebrew language with the Hebrew letters of the alphabet, because there's two different types. There is the pronunciation of Hebrew that's actually written in English, but it's spelled out so that you can read it in English, pronouncing it in Hebrew, if that makes any sense what I'm saying. And then there is the actual Hebrew language that the scriptures are written in. Now, I can't read a lick of Hebrew. I know all 22 letters of the alphabet because I've studied them. I could tell you them. Um, they're written in Psalm 119. I know the numerical values of them, but if you put those letters together and tell me to spell out anything past God's name or maybe Yeshua's, I couldn't do a lick of it. I couldn't tell you. I don't know what it is or anything, but I wanted to see just how it looked. And so I looked it up and to my amazement, when I looked up Psalm 23 and I knew the first verse, the first word in that first verse in Hebrew was yud Hey vav Hey, And I thought, oh my gosh, there it is. This is what the Lord had shown me in the middle of the night when he said, I want you to tell the people to depend on me according to Psalm 23. And I was so excited that I called Rabbi Danun up again and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I found this. I see that it's the name of God that's written in Psalm 23, that Yudhevah is my shepherd, I shall not lack of any good thing. And I said, but you know, in the English it's translated as the Lord. And so I said, so is this correct that wherever we see the word Lord written in our English dictionaries, that it's really the translation of yud heh vah -he. And he told me, yes, that was true. And so it was just very exciting for me. Um, that was my second confirmation. And so what I want to talk to you all a little bit about before I go into the other information that I research, I want to tell you about the name of God, yud heh vah -he. Now, I decided to do research on my own because, again, several years ago, I began to look up the Hebrew alphabet to see um, the meanings of each letter and the numerical value. So I wanted to look up yud heh vah -he and find out what it was, what it meant, and if, it, if I could get any deeper revelation of what God was showing me when he gave this to me that night. And so what I found, saints, was just absolutely phenomenal. And I want to share it with you all. And again, like I said at the end of the video, I will um, find images for you all to at least see what I'm talking about. So you just have, again, a visual of what I'm saying. And again, it just helps you to retain information a little bit better. So um, the first letter, Yud. It actually looks like a little hook or a backwards apostrophe, so to speak. And the word yud is spelled Y-O-D. Um, you can look it up. And it means to, to make. Um, it means, um, let me, I'm just going to look at my notes. It means to make and deed. And deed is an action. Like the Bible says, love is deed and truth. And deed is an action. It's a responsibility. It's an ownership. Okay. It's not like, uh, uh, that's what deed means. And so it means to make, create, or deed. Okay, so that's yud. And then we have the next letter, yud hey. Hey is spelled H-E-Y. Um, I think I've seen this spelled a little bit different in some other places, but typically it's H-E-Y. And hey means breath, and it also means to reveal. So hey means to reveal and then we've had so we've got you hey and then we've got vav oh so let me let me take that back um yud i said something wrong 
um, the meaning, or I forgot something, I should say, the meaning of you back in the ancient times. Because uh, language and, and um, writing, handwriting has evolved over the years, and I think we would all agree with that. Um, even now, there's no manuscript handwriting. Everybody's like, to, you know, beep, beep, beep on typing and texting, um, where we used to have to handwrite everything. So we can agree that language and handwriting has definitely evolved. Well, the same thing with the Hebrew language. So um, in the more ancient times, like we're talking about Moses and Jacob and Abraham and Isaac and and I know I just said all those names backwards, but for a reason, um, they had, you know, their, their writings or their, their manuscripts. So you'd, which means to make or to a deed or to create it, it was an image of an arm, you know, a stretched out arm with the hand closed. Okay. So that was the thing. Okay. So that's what I left out now going back to, Hey, so we talked about, Hey, so Hey means to reveal. And the picture of hay is a man with his arm stretched upward, like to the heavens, okay? All right, so I wanted to make sure I did that. So we've got yud hay, now vav. Um, so vav means to secure and to add. And the picture of vav is a tent pack. Like a tent peg, like, you know, the little thing that you hammer into the ground when you're like going camping and you want to set up your tent and you, they use like the big, the hooks or what have you into the ground so that the tent is secure so the wind doesn't blow it away or what have you. People don't knock it over. Well, that's the picture for Vav. It is a tent peg and it means to add and to secure. And then we've got the last letter of God's name, which means hey, which is hey again, which again means to reveal. So here's the powerful part, saints. Ready for this? Okay. Yud he vah So we've got Y H V H. If we use those letters in our English, you know, context, the name of God spells out everything from beginning to end of mankind. Let me show you. So we've got Yud. Yud means to create. And God is who? He is our creator. He is the uncreated creator. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God also created man, man and male and female. He created us in his image. So in the beginning, God created you. He is the creator. And then we've got you, and then we've got hey to reveal or breath. Well, who did God reveal himself to? Once he created the heavens and the earth and he created mankind, he revealed himself to us. Now, he revealed himself first to Adam. Adam had the perfect relationship with God before he sinned. Adam was able to look up into heaven, saints. Adam was the original, if you want to call it, son of God, before Jesus manifested in the flesh. Adam, even when you look at the genealogy, it says, and Adam was the son of God, Adam. And so he revealed himself to Adam. But then Adam said he got kicked out of the garden and there was a disconnect between mankind and God. But he came later on to... Um, Abram, when he, after which of course, in, in a way he revealed himself to Noah too, but then he came to Abram when he began to separate um, his people, you know, his, he picked his chosen people, which became later the Israelites, you know, the descendants of Jacob. Um, but he first revealed himself to Abram when he, when he came to Abram and told him to take his family and his and his property and to leave um, the land of Ur and to go into the land that he would call him to go, which was very powerful because, you know, he heard his voice, but he didn't know God had manifested himself to him in the physical, but he just trusted 
what he heard. So God revealed himself to Adam. He revealed himself to Abram, who later became Abraham. And through Abraham, we got the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we've got the 12 tribes that who became the Israelites and still the Israelites and the Jewish people as we know of today. And then um, he revealed himself to Moses. After that, that was another part, you know, a third part, because Moses, when he revealed to him, they were in a burning bush. And then through Moses, um, the, the Israelites, the Hebrews were led out of captivity, out of Egypt. They were there for 400 years. And then he brought them across the Red Sea, across out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, across the desert to Mount Sinai, where God revealed himself and gave them the law on the tablets of stone. And so he revealed himself and to those people, to the Israelites, to, um, to the Israelites, the Jewish people during that time. Okay, so we've got you, the creator, he created us, and then he revealed himself to us um, through the Old Covenant in the uh, Old Testament. The word testament just means covenant, okay, and covenant is promise. And he made his promise to Abraham, to the descendants of Abraham that, oh, by the way, still applies today for those of you who teach replacement theology. The devil is a liar. God's covenant is with Israel and with the Jewish people. He made the covenant with Abraham. Israel belongs to God. God is not a liar. He is not one that should lie. He's not the son of man that he should repent. God does not break his promises. And so that means that his covenant still lies true. So for those of you who re who teach replacing theology and say that God has abandoned Israel, he has abandoned the Jewish people, that the Israelites have now been replaced with the church, that is nowhere written in the scriptures whatsoever. And even if you want to try it into the New Testament, go to Romans chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, or actually even back from 20 to 25, where Paul clearly talks about how we as the Gentiles should not be uh, under this illusion that God has tossed off and gotten rid of his people, but that he only allowed a blindness to come up on them so that the world would be saved. Because before then, the covenant was just for the Jewish people, but God so loved not just the Jewish people, but the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it had to be done that way so that the gospel would be preached unto the nations that would give us all the opportunity to be reconciled back to our creator because we all come from God. But like it states again in Romans chapter 11, it says that, that when all is done until the, the fulfillment of the Gentiles has come, and then it says all of Israel will be saved. So do not think that God has turned his back on the Israelites. That is not true. God still has kept his covenant thus far and that's why Israel will never ever ever be destroyed again so anyhow without going off on that tangent getting back to what I was saying so he revealed himself to the Jewish people he gave them um the laws the tablets through Moses so now we've got yud hey now we've got vav now vav um means the tent pack remember it means to add and to secure and we and it, the picture is the picture of a tent peg. And so what did he do to add and secure? He secured his people through the laws, through um, the Ten Commandments and the other 613 laws that are mentioned in the Old Testament. For his people, he secured the Jewish people so that they would be set aside consecrated sanctified and made holy they were set aside and so he secured them through that and so that they would become his people and then through them uh, Christ would come through that lineage of people, through that selection of people who then in turn would become the sacrificial lamb for the entire world for both Jew and Gentile alike so in Vav, he secured his people through the covenant that he made, the promise that he first made with Abraham. And 
now we come to the last part, which is hay, because hay is mentioned twice. We've got hay in the beginning and hay or hay in the middle and hay at the end. And again, hay means again to reveal. Well, God wasn't done yet. He wanted to reveal himself one more time. And who was the rest of the people he had to reveal himself to? The world. And he did that through giving his only begotten son, Jesus, who became the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. So that what Adam had messed up in the beginning through sinning in the garden and separating us from our Abba, from our father, now we can be reconciled back to him. And now because of Jesus Christ becoming the sacrificial lamb for us and spreading his blood on the mercy seat and becoming the high priest and mediation for us forever and ever, we now, as the scripture says that Paul taught, we now can come boldly and confidently before the throne of God, where before we could not. Prior to that, we could not. Prior to that, the Gentiles had no access to God. They didn't really, I mean, they could worship the God of the Israelites, but there were so far and few. There are a few that did that, like Ruth, uh, uh, Ruth is a very good example who was a Moabitess. But, you know, she, through her lineage, you know, she came Jesus, really, you know, or what have you. But Ruth is a good example. So we do have uh, the people who believe, the people who were rescued. We got Rahab and the story of Jericho or what have you. We've got various stories of people who were not Jews who ended up um, becoming a part of them, so to speak, if you want to call it that. But for the majority of the rest of the people, the, the Gentiles were not included. And so they were left out. And, um, but with Jesus coming in, now the whole world would be included. The whole world would now have the opportunity to come to the Lord. And so through him revealing now the second time through Jesus Christ, when Jesus said, I, he told Pontius Pilate, he says, I was born for one purpose, to bear witness to the truth. And all who know truth will hear my voice. That's what he said. And Jesus was born for one purpose, to reveal God. To bear witness or reveal or testify to the truth that God is alive and real. And through his death, he became a witness, not just to the Jewish people, but to the world. And so God now revealed himself to the world in that last part. So we've got the entire story of creation in the name of yud heh which is pretty powerful, saints. The last thing, a part of that that I want to share is that each one had a numerical meaning. And Yud uh, has the numerical meaning of 10. And 10 means testimony. And testimony is what, you know, you're, you're telling it. Well, you means to create, right? And 10 means testimony. Well, the creation of the world is a testimony that God exists. Even in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18, it's clearly stated that the, the nature, the world, the earth, and, and, and everything that is created in it is a testimony that God exists, but that as it continues down in that scripture, but that the people began to make up their own ideas of who God is, and they began to worship the creation instead of the creator. But he said from the beginning, the, the earth itself is testimony that he is real we're without excuse so the creator created all things the heavens and the earth and it is a testimony that he exists not that we've evolved not that evolution is true not that the big bang theory theory is true not that we fell out of the sky somewhere and some ufos and seminated an egg and created mankind no it's a testimony that there is a higher power and it's not the UFOs or extraterrestrials. It is Jesus Christ. It is God the Father. It is God the Holy Spirit who created all things. So we've got you, which is 10. We've got hey, which means is uh, the miracle value of five. Five means grace. 
It is the number of grace in, in the Hebrew meaning. So think about grace. Okay, grace is defined as giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is not giving us what we do deserve. And we do deserve, we all deserve to die and go to hell. And mercy is not giving us that. But grace is giving us what we don't deserve. So because of sin, we have been separated from God and we don't deserve him. But through hey, through the, the revealing of him, and through, and remember I told you it also meant breath. And he breath is what life. When the breath is snatched out of your lungs, you're dead. That's it. I mean, you can't live without air, without breath. Nothing in your body can function. So through the grace of God, he gives us life, and he has revealed himself to us. He through grace, through he has given us the life that breathes in our the, the air that we breathe in our lungs and he revealed himself in the old covenant and then he revealed himself again to us in the new covenant and he gave us a new opportunity of life and that is everlasting life and jesus said i am the way the truth and the life and he also said whoever believes on the son will not perish but have everlasting life so we have obtained life through Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful, saints? Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so then we didn't forget Vav. Vav is in the middle of Hayes, the two Hayes, and Vav is the numerical value of six. Six is the number of man. So what do we say Vav was? Vav meant to add and to secure. He added, he secured mankind through the law that was given to us through Moses. And remember, the law was written on stone. So it, it, it didn't really redeem man. It only showed man how sinful he was. The, the, the tablets and the laws that were given in the Old Testament was a form of discipline, but it didn't really redeem us to the Father. It still didn't give us access to heaven. That's why everyone that died before Christ went down into Sheol, which was translated as the grave. There was a difference between Sheol and a difference between Hades. Hades was a place of torment and Sheol all was just merely the grave it was a holding place or abraham's bosom later it would be it became up until jesus um died and then resurrected and then he emptied all of that out so anyways with all of that said the whole story of us is in the name of god isn't that awesome saints which gives us even more reason why the lord said i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end the first and the last and i think it's the other way around he says the first and last and then the beginning and the end according to the scriptures written in revelation so I wanted to share that you that part with you all. Um, the last part I wanted to share with you is I did a little research on this ancient spirit that was released upon or to be released upon the planet. He said in 14 days, that was exactly exactly two weeks before New Year's. So it was released upon um, New Year's Day, according to our Gregorian calendar. Um, I went and looked up a thousand years ago because I know the things that happen and unfold under the on the planet are examples of what's going on in the spirit realm. A perfect perfect example of that is in the book of Daniel when G when excuse me not Jesus but when Daniel was fasting for twenty one days and we know the story that the angel came and told him that the Lord had answered his prayer on the first day but that it took him twenty additional days to come down and answer him because what he was fighting the principality that was over the land of Persia at that time and he had all he was it was such a battle he had to go back and get michael and ask him for help and they had to come down and do battle against this demons or demons that were hovering in the air at that time that prevented the angel from getting through or penetrating to get down to daniel to to respond to his prayer so that's a perfect example of that so things that happen upon the planet are results of spirits that are manifested upon the planet it can be the good the power of god or the power of the prince or the ruler of the air which is satan himself the power the ruler of this world as jesus mentions in john chapter 14 okay so i went to go look up a thousand years ago and i wanted to see what was going on about a thousand years from the, from ago from now and i found three things saints and i'm going to go over them real quickly the first thing that was so crazy it was just like a headline of what was going on that year china rising islamic militants and sunni and shiite 
wars in the Middle East. Now, when I first saw that, I'm like, that sounds like a headline for today, not a thousand years ago. But that's what was going on. It was an era of China rising, um, Islamic militant, and Sunni and Shiite, which are uh, their tribes and within the Arab communities that are still Islamic, um, fighting against each other in the Middle East. The second thing God found states was that during that year, um, what is now known as Spain and Portugal today, which is just north of the continent of Africa, was at that time known as Cordora, spelled C-O-D-O-R-A. And you can Wikipedia this, you can look this information up for yourself so you know that I'm not just feeding you anything. Um, the entire continent or area of Cordora, which again is known today as Spain and Portugal, was ran and owned and operated through uh, Islamic militants. And it was during that time that there was a massive Jewish genocide. They killed a ton of Jews and then the remainder ones they were kicked out this was 400 years before the Spanish Inquisition that happened 400 years later in 1492 almost 500 years later where they kicked the Jews out of Spain it was a Catholic Church that did that told them to either convert or leave and they also uh, killed a lot of Jewish people for not converting over to Catholicism I won't say Christianity because because it was really Catholicism and so they persecuted the Jewish people they kicked them out and that happened another almost 500 years later the last thing that I found that happened a, th a thousand years ago saints just really blew me away there was a tsunami in the Atlantic Ocean that they believe was caused by a meteor that had hit the Atlantic Ocean um, it's been it's reports it happened specifically on the date of September 28th uh, 1014 and um, t September 28th um, at that year also fell in between the feast the Jewish feast but it was also known as St. Michael's Day and they associated with the great war in heaven that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 12 anyhow um, there was a tsunami that um, came across Europe New York and the Caribbean, the Lesser Antilles is what they were saying. They found proof of that, the what they call tsunami sediments, when the ocean like stirs up all the bottom of the silt and everything that's at the bottom of the ocean and, and it brings it up and that layer of dirt and muck or what have you, it's a layer that settles upon the land. Anyway, so that's what the settlement is. They found proof of that in New York State and in the Lesser Antilles and other parts of the Caribbean, as well as there was actual physical writing reports of it and the reason why I say that is because no one was really occupying the land of North America the continent of North America at that time except the natives but in Europe they were established so there was writings and reports what have you and they have actual writings of a massive tidal wave that came and killed thousands of people saints and they believed that it was caused by a meteorite that hit the Atlantic Ocean. So I thought that was extremely powerful. I knew a lot of people have had dreams about a tsunami coming to the East Coast, um, which would have to be the Atlantic Ocean. I myself also had one of those dreams last July. I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't know if that is a, a tribulation event or if that's going to happen before the tribulation. But I just thought it was extremely interesting of what I found and discovered that had happened a thousand years ago. So I just wanted to share that with you all saints. I want you all to read and study Psalm 23. Um, it's a psalm that everyone knows true enough, but if you go back into that short psalm and you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you, to open up the revelation to it, you will find even more things that you will need in the hour that we're in. We're living in the final hour, saints, the hour of Christ's return. Jesus is coming. We need to have our robes washed, our oil lamps filled. We need to be prepared, prepared. And so if you have not given yourself to Jesus Christ, now is the perfect time to do so. Even if you have backslid, it's time to come home. It's time to give your life over to Christ. It's time to sell out, to stop uh, having one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's time to come out of the world, come out of religious traditions, come out of those, those corners of your life that are secret sins. It's time to clean up them cracks and crevices of our hearts, the deep chambers, the secret sins. Get rid of them. Give them over to Jesus Christ. He loves you. 
He does not delight in seeing that any of his little ones perish. He wants you to come home and spend eternity with him. And so, but he requires us to live holy. Understand that. So I pray that this blesses your soul. I mean, again, look for the end of the video. I will show you um, the pictures of what uh, I was talking about as far as the Hebrew language is concerned. Um, I'm going to also post a, a dedication or rededication prayer for the saints if you are interested in rededicating your life to Jesus Christ. Thank you for supporting us. We look forward to what God is going to do for us in 2014. I pray you all be blessed. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Until we meet again, Shalom.